Right, without any further ado, we'll go on to our next speaker, which is Alex, OZ9AEC. As you can see, I'm really geared up and ready for this. Uh, and he's going to do a satellite-defined radio for the Satellite Geek. Software-defined radio, I should say, for the Satellite Geek. Now, I'm a bit worried about the term geek, because I think geek is probably inappropriate. I think we're all not geeky. We enjoy this. This is fun. This is incredible. I this is amazing. It depends on the generation you're oh. talking to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm old, so this is a generation. So, over to Alex. Okay, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. Then I'll put this in my pocket and no, don't touch it anymore. Um, well, yes, I was trying to say the term geek is actually quite all right to use now if you talk to young people. So I think it's, uh, that's why I chose to use it. <coughs> but before I uh, get into it, I'd like to make a few confessions. First, uh, when, I, uh, when I submitted the title of the project, I was uh, hoping that some projects I've been working on for quite a while would be uh, more finished than they actually are. Uh, but as you know, in space, we are always too late. Uh, so uh, it will not be as much practical as I hoped it would be, but uh, a little more like storytelling. Like Second, I don't know if uh, you got the memo, but I am almost exclusively a Linux user and a developer. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm saying it because uh, I was expecting most people to be Windows users and uh, never really touch Linux or anything. Well, okay, because uh, let's move on then. Uh, I, I was kind of expecting that in one way or other, pretty much everybody is using Linux. Maybe they don't know it, but they are using it. Is there anybody in this room who does not recognize this picture? Of course there is not. Uh, this is the Raspberry Pi. It is a single board computer, which means that it is uh, a full computer packed into one small PCB and it may not be it may not perform as fast as your desktop computers where you watch videos and play games but it does have the same functionality and uh, personally I found it very exciting to see uh, this uh, uh, this development we, we have seen in the availability of these SPCs or uh, single board computers because uh, in ham radio, we use computers a lot, right? Digital modes, uh, logging, and uh, recently also SDRs. But unfortunately, most of our software does not work very well on these boards. And uh, I think we have to do something about it. Uh, or we are working on it, of course. Um, some of you uh, probably know uh, GQRX. No, it doesn't look like this. <laughs> but this is how it looked in uh, 2010. Uh, back then, I was, it was when I started uh, working with, uh, on uh, software-defined radios. Uh, I don't know, maybe some of you remember I was here uh, back then and I was trying to talk about GNU radio. Uh, I didn't understand much about it, but I still tried to talk about it. I don't think many in the audience understood much, much about it, but uh, things have changed since then. In 2010, it was, a, it was written in Python. It was uh, using, because that was the primary interface for writing applications in GNU radio. And it, uh, well, it kind of worked. It could receive signals, but it was really a horrible user experience. I mean, it really wasn't, uh, as you would expect, uh, a user application to work. Uh, and, uh, but then in 2011, I got the FunCube dongle. You guys know what that is, right? <laughs> Uh, and up till that point, we were uh, the, the, the uh, primary SDR or SDR hardware we used was uh, uh, USRPs from Etus. Uh, we had these USRP ones, and they were great. They cost only, uh, I think, a complete kit I bought cost only one thousand five hundred dollars, which was really cheap. I mean, back then it was really nothing. Well, not nothing, but it was cheap. <laughs> Uh, but then uh, Howard came with the FunCube dongle pro and it was a small USB dongle which cost, I don't remember, 150 euros or something like that, yeah. And uh, so at the same time I decided, okay, I'm rewriting GQRX in C++ because I had nothing better to do. So, uh, and uh, at the same time I added support for uh, the FunCube dongle. So uh, that was great. Uh, and. Uh, 2011, uh, of course, there, were all, uh, there, was, there was a lot of other software. And uh, if I recall correctly, SDR Sharp already existed. And that's what, uh, what uh, Howard used uh, to demonstrate the FunCube dongle with. Uh, so there were other opportunities. But uh, I mean, OK, now you guys say you use Linux. But in trust me, in 2011, 
SDR on Linux, I mean, nobody really cared. <laughs> so it's, I, I think there were maybe five users uh, who used this program and said, okay, it was nice and cozy and uh, we had fun. And I thought, I'll just work on it slowly and uh, uh, don't really care about anything else. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, RTL SDR happened. And uh, <laughs> the reason why that was important is because uh, suddenly uh, we had this whole gang of people, uh, of tech geeks, uh, computer geeks, who discovered radios. And uh, uh, they were Linux users, many of them. And suddenly there was a lot of pressure on, on uh, well, can you make GQRX work in, uh, with the RTL SDR? And uh, uh, of course, we worked on it. But suddenly, the, the, the number of users went from uh, five to 500 uh, in, uh, in a matter of very short time. So, this had a lot of impact on, uh, on uh, well, yeah, what uh, both GQRX is today and also what I think SDR uh, is in general. And so in 2012, we, we rewrote the hardware interfacing uh, part of it because at the same time, I learned that there were some people in the Osmocom group. It's a, most a German group of uh, open source uh, uh, telecommunication software developers, and they uh, some of them were working on this uh, hardware abstraction layer for GNU radio. And this means basically that uh, I had uh, GQRX up here, uh, the application, and I only had to worry about one single interface to this library, GR Osmo SDR. And this library took, took care of uh, talking to the different uh, hardware that existed. And this was a great idea because then I could let others worry about uh, adding hardware support and uh, did I do something or? <laughs> That's why I don't use Windows. Okay, so uh, others could worry about the hardware support and I could uh, concentrate on the application for a while at least because you know, as time goes, uh, things change. And uh, so jumping ahead today, we actually managed to get an application which uh, works and supports many different hardware devices. It, uh, if you don't screw up much when you're writing software on Linux, it will actually work on BSD and Mac OS X. Uh, it actually also works on Windows. I don't know why anybody would want to use it there, but uh, it works. Uh, and uh, after some poking around with the code, it actually runs on uh, some of these uh, higher end single board computers like uh, Odroid and Raspberry Pi 2 and 3. Unfortunately, due to historical reasons, it has become quite difficult to maintain and also to deploy it because it started as, a, as a basically just a graphical user interface built on top of GNU Radio, which is a quite large framework, which again has a lot of other dependencies. And uh, so it's, it's quite difficult uh, to use it. But one thing, I, I, in any case, I learned in that process uh, with, with these, all these guys coming in with and using RTL as the other, many people who don't have any background in, uh, in the radio hobby are actually interested in exploring it. Uh, they just need an easy way, easy and affordable way to, to get started. And uh, so if you, take, if you only take one thing away from my presentation, then take this. Now, if you, we try to talk a little bit about uh, SDR in, uh, in satellite communication, which is why we are here. Have, 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 is, anybody, does, is there anybody in the audience who ha hasn't used SDRs uh, at all? Uh, OK. But basically, so I just quickly mentioned that the, the, the software-defined radio it basically means that you have a hardware which uh, digitizes the RF. and as quickly as possible, you have to start doing the processing in software because that gives a lot of flexibility and you don't have to change the hardware when you upgrade. So that's why we like it. And because we, it gives us, we can, uh, uh, you know, we have this, this wide, very nice uh, spectrum uh, view, uh, the pad adapter and the waterfall, as people call it. We can process wider bandwidth signals. We can store and replay the uh, RF or the IF, depending on the architecture. And uh, like I said, it gives a lot of flexibility and also performance advantages because uh, a hardware radio is what it is. It's difficult to improve once it's uh, done. But uh, with a software-defined radio, we can always be better at uh, signal processing and uh, uh, 
keep improving on it. Uh, on this uh, screenshot, or actually it's a dump, it's not a screenshot, but you can see uh, a waterfall plot of, I think it's uh, FO29 uh, uh, downlink, transponder downlink from 2016. And uh, it, it's really great that you can actually see the whole uh, transponder and see what's going on. Usually what you see is that uh, most people are just centered in the middle of the transponder. I don't know, it's like uh, they are afraid of using the edges, uh, I don't know, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, good to see and you see uh, the, the reason why the signals are moving are uh, or not constant in frequencies, of course, the Doppler shift. And uh, so that's one of, that's, uh, that's actually also one of the things that is really cool in the, if you're using SDR for satellites that uh, this Doppler tuning is actually, it becomes a really simple software problem. You don't necessarily have to interface to hardware uh, radios. Uh, uh, so this is a typical setup you may uh, know from uh, when you operate on satellites. You have a satellite tracking application, uh, in this case a uh, SatPC32. Uh, uh, it uh, takes uh, two line elements and the time <coughs> as input and calculates the satellite position. And uh, then it usually has an interface to your uh, antenna and your radio. This interface is usually some serial communication. Maybe newer radios have USB. I don't know if uh, they do. Wow, amazing. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm pretty sure that the latest radios which come with an Ethernet stick still have the serial connector, no? Yeah. But yeah, it works. It's, um, if it works, don't fix it, uh, some people say. So, but it, it's, it's, so that's what we normally do. It's a, quite simple setup. If we have the right <coughs> radios that are well supported, they work well. Um, but now I had the GQRX, which was a so piece of software. I was thinking, okay, how the hell do I make it work with a satellite tracking application that uh, uh, runs, uh, uh, controls uh, serial uh, applications? But uh, fortunately, on Linux, we do things a little differently. In Linux, uh, we, I, I was lazy. You may recognize this screenshot as a gpredict. It's a Linux satellite tracking application. And I say I was lazy because I didn't want, again, to implement uh, the hardware interface to the different radios and rotators. So instead, I decided I will use something called the HamLib, which is uh, the uh, nickname for the ham radio control libraries. It's a quite old package, uh, or it was started a long time ago with the purpose, again, of providing a uniform uh, programming interface uh, to all radios, all ham radios. So, uh, and you can uh, use it from applications, you can uh, use it through a network. It actually comes with a network server, so it can be used to control your radios uh, remotely. And uh, yeah, it supports pretty much all radios that uh, exist and have existed. Uh, some backends may be not fully implemented, but it depends on the testers. But the point is that in gpredict, I could simply implement this uh, network interface, the TCP connection, and uh, then it can work also both on the same computer, on uh, different computers, uh, even remotely. And best of all was that uh, I decided that in uh, GQRX, the software-defined radio, instead of implementing some uh, serial interface, I could just simply make it look like it was a Hamlib server, right? So when uh, I configure gpredict to talk to gqrx, it just thinks it talks to hamlib. It doesn't know the difference. Uh, what's even better is that uh, this also allows me to use it together with an existing radio. If I only have a receiver, I can still use my old radio for transmitting. Why not? Uh, gpredict can be configured to use two different radios for uplink and downlink. So it worked out uh, pretty well and uh, was one of the few uh, good decisions we made uh, in uh, implementing uh, GQRX. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, this, uh, this TCP interface makes GQRX look like uh, it was a Yesu or ICOM or whatever radio. And uh, it can also be used by uh, other applications that support Hamlib. And uh, that's, for example, uh, FLDG. Pretty, I'm sure most of you know it. Uh, so uh, they can also uh, interface to it. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we extended the protocol uh, by adding uh, triggers for uh, 
AOS and LOS when the satellite comes up and goes down, so you can start the recording uh, automatically. And uh, yeah, there's also possibility for audio streaming, but uh, that's just uh, another connection. But uh, uh, GQIX was becoming useful, but uh, still uh, quite difficult to maintain. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, a few years ago, in, uh, in 2014, I, uh, I started, uh, th th that was the point when GQX was uh, actually quite useful my, uh, by then. And, uh, but I got interested in remote uh, operations and uh, also I wanted uh, to make GQRX uh, work better in these uh, single board computers. And in 2014, they weren't very fast. So it's, uh, even if it runs today, it uh, didn't really work uh, back then. Uh, the remote operations was because I got uh, I moved outside out uh, of the city, so I had a lot of driving to do. And I thought, hey, it, it would be great if I could uh, use ham radio while I was driving. Uh, but of course, I didn't want to put huge uh, HF antennas on my car because I have I have an old car, and I'm pretty sure it will fall apart or anything. So. Uh, I got an IC706 from uh, Jörn uh, for a good price, uh, second hand, and he also showed me there was this uh, very smart remote rig uh, kit, which uh, you could connect the front panel to and the radio to, and you could use it over the internet. Unfortunately, this kit cost the same as I paid for the radio, so I couldn't really justify it. Uh, I said, okay, I should be able to do it somehow, and uh, that's why I did a little remote radio project. Maybe some of you heard of it. It's uh, basically I took two beagle bones, connected uh, the front panel to it and uh, the radio to the other one, and uh, used a single TCP connection to to uh, yeah, forward the commands. And of course, I was experimenting with protocols and uh, trying different audio codecs. Uh, I liked in particular this uh, audio codec called uh, Opus. It's uh, it's a free uh, open source co uh, voice codec that can scale from, uh, I think, uh, six kilobits per second and up to maybe hundreds, 100 kilobits per second. It's uh, also used in Skype today, I think. So uh, it's pretty awesome. And Flex Radio use it. So, sorry? YouTube is also. Really? Open wow. Yes. I didn't know. Yeah. It's, it's re pretty cool. I think if anybody is looking into to uh, uh, audio streaming with respect to remote operations. You should really look at Opus and forget all the other things because you can get low latency and uh, of course it has some processing uh, requirements. But uh, it was pretty cool. I was uh, driving around in my car like this. Uh, I had the front panel uh, sitting loose there and you can see the beagle bone and the 4G uh, router in that box and I had an external 4G antenna and uh, yeah, it worked, worked great. Uh, <laughs> I, I never got to, to implement the transmitter part, but uh, yeah, it, uh, it, uh, it was cool. Then the other thing I found in uh, 2000, or learned about in 2014, was the RF Space Cloud IQ. This was basically like uh, a web SDR, which I'm sure you know, web SDR in a box, right? And you could go and get it. You can download web SDR, unfortunately, but this radio you can go out and buy. and. It can run either as a uh, traditional uh, SDR, uh, traditional SDR, <laughs> an SDR that streams uh, raw samples to the host, or uh, with its built-in web server inside. And uh, when it runs its, its own uh, server inside, then it uh, can produce this low bitrate uh, stream. So you're streaming the demodulated audio and the spectrum, uh, uh, pretty much like web SDR works, or the same concept. So this was really cool, and uh, uh, part of it was open source in the beginning of the client, so I could see how, uh, uh, how RF Space did the protocol and what, what, uh, how they did the connections. And together with my own uh, experiments uh, uh, with the, this uh, IC706, I could see that, okay, this, this can really work, the single TCP connection, because I, I did a... I did some research into uh, some existing setups because many other people were doing remote connections at that time. There's really nothing new about it, but it was always either run some VPN or do a remote desktop connection home or run some uh, voice over IP uh, central somewhere. Uh, no, single TCP connection and that's it. It has these disadvantages, but it can work. So I was thinking, okay, uh, if I want to, to do this for uh, other SDRs, can I, can I do it with GQRX? Uh, 
yeah, sure, I could do it. But at that point, I was getting a little fed up with uh, maintaining GQRX because, uh, uh, as you can see and on this uh, simplified dependency diagram, uh, I have GQRX on the top. This is the user application. This is what I wanted to work with. But then it uh, depends on GNU radio and the GR Osmo SDR and QT, that's the graphical toolkit, so that's fine. But then for historical reasons, all these uh, driver libraries are, are linked and uh, uh, there are a lot of cross dependencies there that makes it quite difficult. If I update one of these libraries, then uh, I have to be careful with what needs to be updated and it's, uh, <laughs> it's really a lot of sweat that goes into creating a complete package just as you know if you have downloaded it either the Mac uh, bundles or the Ubuntu packages it's uh, it has been a lot of work and uh, uh, there was also some other mo uh, architect or te technical problems in uh, the, the way it works with the, the with linking to the drivers if, if one of the libraries uh, have an error then uh, the whole application will crash and uh, we have uh, different uh, philosophies of how we should handle errors so it's um, old-fashioned and uh, others use uh, C++ more the way C++ is supposed to be used so it's uh, uh, yeah um, and the other thing was about GQRX this is one of the latest uh, user interfaces uh, that you may recognize it runs on the Raspberry Pi but the user interface is not very, very touch friendly and it's also not very well suited for smaller screens so it's uh, when it comes to remote operations and uh, in particular something that's mobile or uh, portable then it's not not it it's either needs a lot of modification or maybe we just start from scratch or a new design <coughs> i chose the latter uh, uh, and this was back in 2014 so i st still kept on working on gqrx that's why we still have releases and it's still maintained to some degree but um, i started to work on a new project and initially, I wanted the client and the server, of course, like the cloud IQ. But uh, in time, I realized that uh, uh, simple command line tools like RTL, FM, you may know, or uh, uh, the direct uh, graphical user interface will be much, uh, or, or is very useful when you're testing uh, also. So, uh, and it may sound like a, a lot of work to do all this, uh, begin from, uh, from uh, all over again, but it's actually not. Uh, as I learned from GQRX, if you just uh, d design them a little or think about it a little, then it, then it will all work out, I think, at the end. Uh, uh, this is basically, I think, you see, it's, it's a little cleaner or a little easier to see what's going on on this diagram uh, than it was on the other. And on the bottom, we have the hardware drivers called libsdr1, 2, and 3. And uh, uh, it's still a good idea to have a hardware abstraction layer. Uh, then, of course, we need a uh, signal processing library, the DSP lib, and then we have a receiver and a transmitter, uh, kind of like the sequencer, you know, the, some middle layer which uh, reads samples from your device, processes them, and sends uh, it to the audio. That can run independently. And on the top, we have the high-level uh, high application. And it did, in this case, it uh, shows the client and the server version of it. But if, say, we want to look at uh, the console application itself with the direct, uh, then it's pretty much most of it. You see, it's the same. It's just the 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 upper the, the application that's different. So, uh, and the, even further, if we uh, take a command line interfaces again, uh, most of the same code, but now a, a different user interface. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I don't know how we are running on time. Uh, sorry? OK. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so uh, uh, my, my, the, the design principle, by the way, let's try to minimize the dependencies because uh, complexity is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I personally, I I'm, I'm think I'm too, too dumb to be able to work with complex uh, setups because I, it's, uh, there's always something that breaks and <laughs> I don't know how to fix it. So it's, uh, let's keep it as simple as possible, minimal dependencies, uh, not too many functionalities. And uh, like I mentioned, I'd like the, the user interface to be uh, a little more touch friendly. And uh, I think the, the important thing here is that, uh, or I learned from uh, working with GQRX that if I just 
use the, uh, the, the graphical toolkit, in this case Qt, uh, it actually helps, uh, helps you a lot in making good uh, user interfaces that can scale. So uh, don't try to be too, uh, too smart and uh, design your own buttons or uh, something like that because uh, yeah, that uh, <laughs> will backfire at the end. Uh, I put in the hooks for physical interface. Apparently, adding knobs and buttons to SDRs is a thing today, uh, and I'm totally with you. I think it's great. In particular, when I'm driving a car, I don't want a touch screen. I mean, no, no, it's good uh, with the uh, buttons. So, uh, and also there, I think we can do it very simple uh, without having a, s a secondary interface, just using the toolkit as it is. Um, but that's a, I think that's a different presentation, so I won't get into details there. One thing that I will be interesting to see if we can make the user in same user interface work on small screen and large screens. I have no idea if it's possible, but uh, I think it's possible to go from uh, to, to scale it from seven inch to thirty inch, maybe. But if uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> uh, and the other thing, I yeah, actually, it's very important. I didn't mention it about GQRX is a verified uh, SDR hardware support and. Uh, that was one of the dumbest mistakes I've made in my life. And actually, I made it twice. <coughs> uh, and that was with these uh, hardware abstraction layers, is to th say, think, OK, somebody else working on adding these hardware driver backends. I just have to worry about the application. <coughs> but then what happens when a user uses this application? I mean. OK, if let's say maybe there is a hardware backend that's not fully finished and it's not working all the time or it needs some configuration. It's not working for the user. And then the user runs the application. It's not working. They have no idea about this architecture. And of course, they shouldn't have any idea about the architecture. So don't. I'm not going to ship any software again where, with, that supports hardware that has not been tested by myself. So that's period. I'm saying it here. on video record. <laughs> Don't ask me to support software that I, or hardware that I do not have. So uh, it does actually exist. Uh, and uh, this is a photo I took a few uh, days ago. Uh, you will probably rec recognize much of the, or most of the graphics from GQRX. I um, said I'm starting for, from scratch. That doesn't mean I'm not stealing from other projects like we usually do in open source. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, they will need a lot of work to make it uh, work uh, good on touch screens. But uh, uh, here it's running on the Raspberry Pi with its, its seven inch touch screen. And it's uh, actually working surprisingly good. Up until that point, I was basically only working on a PC. Uh, but uh, as I learned, my <laughs> believe it or not, my PC at home uh, is slower than a Raspberry Pi 3, I think. Because uh, when I saw this, that uh, CPU load, it was, oh, wow, that was actually good. <laughs> so uh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a work in progress, but it's, it, it's, uh, it really exists and it works. And, uh, I think in a few weeks, uh, it, it will uh, probably be available for download for people who feel adventurous uh, and want to test uh, things that may not necessarily work. I also had one of the things that is almost mature by now is uh, the command line receiver, this RTL FM-like uh, receiver I made uh, in the process. It's uh, actually running as my Satnox ground station. Uh, Satnox is a project to create a network of ground stations. Uh, we, you may have heard of Genso before, and I don't th think there were many attempts. It's, uh, uh, this is the newest one, but it's actually cool because it's, people are working on it, and it's open. And what it does, it's uh, the Satnox network fetches uh, data from a database about the satellites. Then the users can schedule passes uh, on the network's web interface, and then uh, the network will present to them a set of uh, potential ground stations that can receive uh, that satellite. And then locally, I have a Setnox client running, which uh, gets the schedule information from the network. It executes the, uh, the receiver, get, recaptures the, uh, the... In my case, I'm using my own receiver. Setnox also have a, another uh, a receiver implementation, but I'm just simply capturing the, the data and the uh, post-processing it and uploading it back to the network. Uh, this, this has been working well for, I think, 
three months or more. It's uh, an air spy connected to an upboard. That's all. It's uh, receiving uh, telemetry and weather satellite images. And uh, I'm uploading daily images uh, to, my, uh, to a photo album just for fun. Uh, and uh, it's a, uh, th this is really how I, I want to think about when I'm thinking about uh, receiving telemetry from a satellite. Of course, it's fun to watch it uh, uh, on a desktop, uh, watch the spectrum and all that thing. But in the long run, when it's, you want to receive satellite or uh, telemetry for a long time, you don't want to sit in front of the computer or have a computer running. Uh, not if, uh, if you can do with much less. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty cool. Uh, on a hardware side, as I said, only verified hardware support. It's, uh, so already working is the RTL SDR, of course, SDR IQ, the AirSpy R2, and the AirSpy Mini. Planned uh, support is for AirSpy Air HF Plus, Cloud EQ, FunCube Dongle, SoftRock. Again, it's basically a selection of devices that I already have. Uh, and uh, one thing that I also want to have, maybe not this year, but early next year, is support for uh, transmit uh, or SDRs that can transmit. Because, uh, yeah, I think we should go that way. <laughs> may, 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 uh, I, I know many of these devices. Uh, well, OK, there are some of the shortwave uh, transceivers that are actually pretty cool and are intended for to be used on the air. But I know many of these HEC RF and LIME SDR and Pluto SDR are, are not so much, uh, yeah, you, they, they need the, some, a lot of extra hardware. But uh, still, it, I think it can be fun to experiment with. Uh, uh, so yeah. I forgot to include the SPY server. <laughs> uh, I think I have a good time. So for a few more slides or? 14 minutes, OK. Yeah, good, yeah. I have a few more slides, then we can go to questions. Uh, uh, I included a few details about the client-server uh, specs, which means it's, uh, it's uh, the goal. Uh, <laughs> uh, I said a single TCP connection. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I, think it can, I think it can work uh, well. The uh, disadvantage of using a single TCP connection is that uh, TCP uh, uh, the TCP protocol guarantees that your packets are going to be delivered, which means that if you have a bit bad connection, in particular over mobile networks, as I learned, uh, packets will be retransmitted until they are uh, acknowledged or it will wait on. And so you can build up a lot long latency. Uh, and uh, I think there are, there are several strategies that can be used to mitigate that. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, if you want to do remote operations, you will probably want to use a, a somehow reliable connection. <laughs> and even if you use some of the other protocols which were designed to handle these things, uh, UDP and RTP, and I mean, bad connection, you will not get the data through anyway. So it's, uh, uh, they, they do different things, but as long as you can, uh, have a strategy to control the latency and keep it down, maybe reset the connection. Uh, I think a single TCP connection will work just fine. And it's much simpler for the user to, to, to set it up because you just have a server and the client and the client connects to the server. So it's as it should be. Uh, from a bandwidth point of view, I think uh, Realistic goals can be 20 kilobit per second to few megabits per second. Uh, of course, the more bandwidth you give it, the more features you will have. With 20 kilobits per second, you will probably only have some, yeah, mediocre audio and maybe some one frame per second FFT or something like that, not more. But uh, if you analyze uh, uh, WebSDR, uh, uh, with a network analyzer. I wish there were more details about that system. Uh, but uh, you can really see it's uh, actually it, it's, it's pretty well optimizes the bandwidth uh, compared to what you get. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are many strategies to explore, like how to compress various parts of the, the spectrum. Uh, yeah. And uh, from audio point of view, we talked about Opus codec, which is, I think, it's the best default choice. Uh, yeah, the raw codec is, is good, uh, still good in particular if you want to do some post-processing, then you may want to avoid uh, compressing the audio. Although I, I heard that when uh, you use Opus audio on flex radios, uh, they can still uh, decode the digital modes afterwards. But of course, that's because the, 
the bandwidth of the data signal itself is very limited. So uh, if you compress uh, audio down to maximum, it will still have, as long as it's just a compression, uh, it will still uh, carry the 3 kilohertz bandwidth for you. So it's, that's why it's not a problem. Uh, and of course, like uh, most SDRs uh, offer the opportunity to, to work with raw IQ st stream instead of audio. And I think we will need that uh, because that's a, good, that, that's, a, that's a good interface to have to other applications. It's, uh, it's pretty good. And uh, yeah, latency can be low or high. I think 10 milliseconds is probably the, the lowest latency we can uh, realistically ex expect from, uh, from SDRs that uh, involve uh, a computer running a non-real-time operating system. I think if you look at the ICOM uh, IC7300, this new small radio, which is a SDR inside, it's, I think they specify, I don't know if anybody knows it, but it's, I think the lowest latency they have is about uh, two, three milliseconds, I think, in CV mode, uh, something like that. But that is a highly integrated uh, thing, and so optimized for that. Uh, you can't change anything, so it's, uh, um, yeah. But the, uh, my own practical perspective on, on latency is that, okay, when I'm operating remotely, I know that it's far away and I expect latency. I will not be uh, doing this on the tuning dial like I'm used to do at home, right? It's, I will change channels or make uh, slow steps and wait for it to update. So it's, uh, I think it's as much a question of operating habit than, uh, than uh, trying to do something that works as you're used to. Yeah, and some other info. It's a uh, simple C and C++. Uh, I, I learned programming in C and in C++ many years ago. I have no idea about all the new language features that C++ offers, so I will just not use them. I think at the end it will make simpler code to read and understand, which I, uh, may be a good thing because I think it's difficult to find the uh, hams who can uh, do this low-level coding. and. Uh, but I think if the code is simple, then maybe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, BSD license uh, for most of it. Uh, and I hope it will be available by the end of the October. Ah, now it's on record, so. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, yeah, October, this year or next year, so. Uh, yeah, I think this was it. Uh, uh, I don't have a website. I don't really have a good name I don't know yet but uh, if you want so if you want to keep updated then you can follow me on Twitter or go to that uh, recently update or created group uh, and sign up uh, I think there are already five people who signed up so <laughs> and uh, yeah I think uh, we, we are working on it uh, and uh, we are actually working uh, there are many people working on it yeah so yeah I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear we've got at least an hour and a half for questions. No. <laughs> so, who's got a question first? Thank you. Uh, Alex, I've been following you for a long time as a, uh, your open source software. I'm just fascinated, what's the mechanism by which you get your source into the community? Like when I do updates on my Raspberry Pi and your, your libraries come down, how does it come from you? Well, uh, on on the Raspberry Pi, Pi specifically, they don't come from me that directly. Um, so that's, it's, it's quite difficult on Linux because, well, it's, it's easy on, in some ways and difficult in other ways because the, the normal way of doing this is that the developer writes the code, writes the application, and it's open source. So the idea is that other people can get the source and compile it for themselves. That worked fine in the 80s and 90s when there were 100 people who did that, but and they were all experts and whatnot. But uh, it's it's difficult to have it uh, have have you know those who just use a level do that. So today we have uh, Linux distributions uh, who take this uh, task of taking source code and compi uh, compiling them into packages and distributing it to users. So when you download, when you are running a Debian, which is a Raspberry Pi uh, based on, then you get packages from Debian. 
and the same with Ubuntu on desktops or Red Hat uh, distributions and all the others. Uh, the problem with, uh, with this is that uh, the, these packages are often, uh, so once they may release a version of the distribution, they will not upgrade the packages to newer versions. So they, on, in, that version stays there until the next version of the distribution comes out. Uh, so uh, that's why when we have we are, we are dealing with software which is still very much a work in progress uh, then you want to have it out to your users quickly faster you, you don't want to wait one and a half year till the next version of uh, Respian or uh, Debian uh, so yeah it's 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 difficult and that's what make, made GQRX difficult to maintain because we decided uh, I decided stupid that I am that I will package GQRX and everything that it depends on and distribute it for Ubuntu I said okay I can do Ubuntu but uh, that's it uh, and since then I got help from or uh, went together with uh, somebody else and uh, the Lime uh, SDR project also helped a lot then. but that's basically what we do we take all the packages including GNU radio and uh, the drivers uh, and all the packages where it makes sense to have a newer version and make it uh, available. So uh, that has taken a lot of work and what, what has made me a bit uh, upset is that this is work that could be done by many other people. So it's, it's uh, because it's packaging, you, you just, you, you learn how to package and there's description and, uh, but I guess the, the projects are not uh, big enough to, to attract so much attention because I think it's only a matter of uh, statistics. So if you have uh, 10,000 users, then there will be two who will contribute. If you have 20,000 users, then there will be four, and so on. So, yeah. So, yes. so you SFTP it up to a server, do you? Yeah. And then yeah. somebody takes over from there. Well, no, no actually, well, so, with, uh, but uh, on the Raspberry Pi, I, uh, so that's from, uh, that's, uh, that's Debian who does it, except the binaries that I built some time ago, because the packages that came from Raspbian, they were not uh, sufficiently well built. That's another problem that often they just build the software and don't really run it. So they don't know if it works properly. <laughs> uh, and th yeah, th there is a lot of software in Linux, so th it's, it's uh, difficult to do. But uh, it's normally, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think so. So the normal way would be that, that you take the software and upload it to a package archive and then the distribution you are using has a mechanism so that you can tell it that use this server to get these packages. And Ubuntu has it, Debian has it too. Uh, uh, so, yeah. But I think uh, when we have, uh, as we reduce the number of dependencies to a few libraries, uh, and currently I'm only using uh, Qt and uh, something called uh, Speaks DSP. I only use one resampling function, which I will replace. But both of these are uh, are available uh, uh, in the distributions, so I can basically d distribute the binary. Uh, and yeah, so it's. Uh, I think distribution on Linux will always be a problem. So the 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 more you as users learn about it, the easier it will be. But uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>